Greetings, Dr. Joseph Martin here. History of All World Medicines, Part 1. Now, I just want to say a little bit about my background, research, clinical work, and training, because I have background in all of the medicines that I will be speaking about, including Western medicine, anatomy, physiology, cell physiology, and so on and so on. And I have training in Ayurvedic, Chinese medicine, Tibetan medicine. Most importantly, though, I have some graduate work that I did at university here in Canada, the University of Toronto, in the history and philosophy of medicine. And I've done 40 years of clinical work and research and writing, and I'm offering these videos to you on the challenges and the changes that we will be experiencing in the 21st century and for the next 10,000 years. Our understanding of human nature, who we are, the cosmogenesis of the universe and humanity, and who we are as real human beings. Now, let's just start at the beginning, and there will be other videos um, on the nature of different world medicines, but I will be doing a separate related series on the philosophy of medicine, and then another series on the future of medicine. Now, Western medicine is 100 years old, and if we were to put all of the medical knowledge of the planet Earth into a 24-hour time clock, the Western medicine would be one second to midnight. So we need to understand that Western medicine is brand new. It's hardly even being born. And it's based only on one of the four ways of knowing, which is the scientific logic and the scientific method of thesis, hypothesis, research, clinical research, and repositing new theses based on our research. And as well as the scientific method, there are other means of knowing who we are, how we tick, and what medicine and healing can really be all about. For the most part, Western medicine, the germ theory, the microorganizational germ theory of, of just um, bacteria, viruses, and so on, spirochetes, is only 100 years old and was based on the training that doctors in America got 100 years ago after the great influenza outbreak after the First World War in 1918. And it's worth noting that uh, doctors didn't train much in the Western world in the late 1800s, uh, certainly in America or Canada. They didn't require much university training. They had less training than engineers, and they didn't even need university degrees. And, of course, women weren't admitted. So Western medicine basically is great for surgery and emergencies, but their understanding that we get in universities worldwide, and I'm sorry to say that even in the Eastern traditions now, like India and China, their ancient 5,000-year-old medical traditions are now thrown out the window and they're using Western medicine for the most part. So there was a backlash in the late 19th century in America by the people and by other people who had training in herbal medicines and so on to realize that if you wanted to stay healthy, you could not let yourself be imprisoned by the medical tradition that was gaining in prominence and became a status symbol for those who were medical doctors. And new status and political hierarchy and it has no place in medicine. It has nothing to do with the healing of individuals. And there should be nothing um, garnered or given to those people, particularly the pharmaceutical companies these days, who seem to run the money system and they have their, their hands in the pockets of medical doctors and hospitals and research clinics in universities and corporations worldwide and governments as well. Now, so Western medicine, although germ theory and genetics are actually basic to some part of the physical, biological understanding of human nature, there are many more components to human nature that medicine doesn't uh, train their students in these days. And that would include some very basic things, just like nutrition or even psychology. There are very few courses in university to train as a medical doctor in psychology and also other things to do with connection to the cosmos and the evolution of humanity, the species itself. So that's Western medicine. Now, the, in terms of the study of all world medicines, we really know that, in fact, 
There is Eastern medicine, and we can go back to the earliest one we know of, which can be anywhere as we came to our knowledge from 5,000 to 8,000 years old in India, called Ayurveda, just new here to the Western world and the Western mind since about 1975. I have trained in Ayurveda in this um, world, in this continent here, at the Ayurvedic Institute in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Then the Ayurvedic knowledge was melded with some earlier traditional Chinese medicine as it traveled to China about 5,000 years ago. And then, of course, we have Tibetan medicine and there are other Asian medicines in uh, the Philippines and so on, which leads us to an even earlier focus on medicine, which would be the First Nations indigenous peoples of all the cultures, of which there are thousands, and they had the herbal pharmacopoeias in which they were aware of what to use in terms of roots, stems, berries, leaves, and plants, and the spirit medicine of the spirit of the plants and the trees and the berries and the fruits. All this is amazingly now being studied as much has been lost, but some anthropologists, medical anthropologists like myself, have studied this worldwide in all of the seven continents, in fact. But let me just go back to Western medicine for a moment. When you do a tiny bit of study in the history of medicine and medical faculties in the Western universities, you will go back to, they'll talk about Galen and Hippocrates and Hippocratic Oath, and a study a bit about the four humors with Galen and so on. Unfortunately, what is omitted is all the notion and the understanding and knowledge we have from Arab medicine. Moses Maimonides and many other Arab people, and unfortunately because of some sectarian science and the sectarianism of scientific people these days, we tend to omit anything that's good from the Arab world. And I think, unfortunately, that's a big mistake in terms of understanding truth and knowledge. And not only the Arab world, but we have in the Dark Ages, since the fall of Rome in the 6th century AD, we have all of the knowledge that was gained, uh, particularly herbal medicine, by all the monks in the monasteries of Europe during the time of the Dark Ages, from 500 AD up until 1600 AD. There is so much knowledge there. Uh, based also on some spiritual practices and growing their own herbs within the monastery walls, that Western medicine would we do well to integrate into their knowledge base of human uh, nature and human biochemistry, human physiology. So there's yet another part that's been left out of Western medical training. Now, in the last 200 years, there are other aspects of, we could say, alternative kinds of Western medicine that have come up, and one of them is theosophical medicine, and a derivative from that, which is even far greater in my estimation, which is anthroposophical medicine, which was started by Dr. Rudolf Steiner, the founder of the Waldorf schools, and all sorts of biodynamic farming and so on. As well, we have uh, Dr. Samuel Hahnemann, who was the founder in Europe a few centuries ago of homeopathy, which spread to India, and probably the one place that is prominent now in the 21st century where homeopathic is most widely studied and understood is in India and possibly also in Germany. And there are a few pockets in Canada and America where homeopathic medicine is totally understood. Out of that has been derived naturopathic medicine. We have a number of naturopathic medical colleges here in Canada, three or so. And while there is a lot of power and knowledge in naturopathic study, I think, unfortunately, the politics of it, as with medical doctors, the naturopathic community uh, politically has tried to um, find some common ground and some kind of a leverage with the, the politics of the medical world and the medical physicians and their organization and try to reduce the, the knowledge of herbs and so on and uh, assume that they're having and using simply a scientific logic for what they're doing in their training and also in their 
um, the way that they deliver medicine to the world. Um, that, that's not true science and that's not true medicine and that will never take us where we need to go when we understand where um, medicine needs to be. So uh, <clears throat> beyond all of these matters, we can say that we could go back before ancient Indian China to earlier and Tibet, to earlier places and peoples in the world. Now, this might put some of you out of your box, but we do have historical and archaeological evidence for this as well as spiritual cognition. And that would be the fact that we have a lot of knowledge now about Atlantean medicine. And yes, Atlantis did exist. In Atlantis, there was a great effort to use understanding of the astral emotional nature of human beings and the astral body and its vibration to do emotional healing. And in that respect, uh, there was a lot of use of different forms of healing that had to do with energy and vibration, and particularly magnets. A magnetic theory came back uh, about 150 years ago in Germany, um, and that's another topic we'll get into when we do part two. And that's the basis of hypnosis, modern scientific medical hypnotherapy, also, also of which I've been trained in through Dr. Milton Erickson and other people like neuro-linguistic programming. But to go back to Atlantis, there was a lot of awareness of using crystals and magnets and the magnetic power of the human heart and the human mind to understand how one can heal oneself. And there was no reliance on other people to do the healing. And I dare say that in future, as many other prominent medical visionaries have stated in our century, that um, the doctors will not be needed. You'll be doing self-doctoring, but more of that in another video. We could go back before Atlantis to Lemuria. And yes, that was an ancient civilization of which we know a lot now. And in that place and time with these people, etheric healing and etheric medicine was very important. They used uh, color and water, and they used aromatherapy and they used sound and music and pools of different colored waters, like the different rainbow colors, each one seven pools for the seven colors in the water with the sound and the aroma to do deep um, soul and emotional and etheric energy healing. Some of this has come back in different forms now and is being reused in a modern way. So we could even go back before that. There are Civilizations before that, this is part of the seven video series on the several civilizations, the overweening large civilizations on planet Earth from times immemorial. And we could go back to Hyperborea and before that Polaris, or Polaria as it's sometimes called, in which case um, humans were just starting to form from an etheric and a mind body, more of an emotional astral body, and also a physical biochemical body. But that's topic for another time. This is simply an overview. Now, we also need to say, I want to just put in a little aside here, that the use of technology and machinery, heavily complex computerized machinery, both for diagnostic treatments and also for um, the treatment itself, and I do mean radiation here, we know that this kills the cells and it kills the soul and it kills the hope. And while it's been used for cancer treatments widely, we know from oncology that, in fact, that these are deadly things. And eventually, for the most part, the percentage statistically is that people will eventually die. There are other means to give hope to people in which you can heal yourself. This has been proven in not only my research, but many other researchers by prominent scientists around the world who have spent their life, like myself, delving into this. So... <clears throat> That's topic for another, the use of medical technology. There's a good side to it, but there's also something we need to look at, which is not so good and it's not healthy. There's always two sides to everything, and science and scientists should know this and should not promulgate just one side of thinking and um, elude or ignore the negative sides of what science can do. Uh, hope above all, and do no harm. These are the basic tenets that we have when we're working with ourselves with healing. Now, other than that, I'd like to suggest that um, 
I said there will be some videos on the philosophy of medicine, the ontology and epistemology of medicine, how, who we are, why we're here, how we tick, and the full complex nature of human beings. Now, the sectarian scientists who only focus on the physical, material, biological being are at this point, unfortunately, not aware of, nor do they study, nor are they seemingly interested in the other emotional, psychological, mental, unconscious, superconscious, and spiritual, energetic, cosmological axes and, and accesses to true human nature on the highest universal open system level. Part of the reason this general systems theory, which has been around for 50 years, needs to be studied with all the feedback loops in order for scientists and med medical people and professionals to understand exactly who we are and how we work, structure and function and flow and healing. Now, we can also say that there have been other people in our Western tradition that unfortunately have been ignored, and one of them, in fact, could be considered in the history of medicine to be one of the founders of Western medicine is Paracelsus. And in a future video, we will look at him as well as Samuel Hahnemann, the founder of homeopathic medicine. Well, now in my 40 years of clinical work and research and study at universities and studies on my own, I've come up with a formula that's based on ancient science and ancient human nature that considers from the Bhagavad Gita and all the Sanskrit texts of India that have to do with yoga and meditation and also Ayurvedic medicine and sound therapy and sound healing probably the most extensive and systematic way of looking at what human nature is and how we can heal ourselves. And this would be the, what I formulated as energy medicine or vibrational medicine. Now there are others in the world, uh, some of them Western minds who have also come up with some of these uh, uh, awarenesses of knowledge in the last 30 or 40 years. And, and so this seems to be a consciousness that's growing here in the world. It's a meme. It's a worldview. It's an ethos to realize the limitations of Western medical science as it exists today, because there's not a great track record uh, with the use of Western medicine other than surgery and emergency, and particularly not the pharmaceuticals with great side effects and toxic effects that often are deadly. And also the fact that um, some of these things, particularly around cancer, just simply will not create an ongoing living healthy life for people. The essence of human nature is joy, and the essence is not going to be found in just medical prescriptions or drugs. It has to come from the inside out, not from the outside in. Now, what I want to say then is, going back to the indigenous peoples of all the planet, that they had an awareness, and we're going to base a lot of what we'll be talking about in the future on this, of the herbal medicines and the plant medicines, and they understand that all these plants have a spirit mother, or a mother spirit, that is the energetic healing potential within the plant itself, whatever the plant may be, whatever the root, whatever the berry, whatever the leaf, whatever it is, or the tree or the tree leaf or the fruit, they all have a, a mother spirit to which one needs to be spiritually and energetically and consciously connected. This is what all the indigenous peoples, whether they be shamans or medicine men or medicine women, knew about, and this is how they utilize deep healing. And there are other aspects of this as well, which we'll get into in further videos. It's all connected to spirit. There are animal medicine spirits that we use in the indigenous ways to also procure and effect a final and complete and a good, perfect healing. A healing spiritually, mentally, both consciously and unconsciously. A healing psychologically and the deep emotions and the deep feelings which are blocked and locked within the human physiology and anatomy and biochemistry and can be released, transmuted, and transformed. And then also, of course, we need to tend to the physical body itself with its needs for breath, first of all, which is prana or chi or ki, as we say, and arenda in the Mohawk way, and also for meditation, harmony and balance in the mind, we'll create 
harmony and balance in the physiology and the biochemistry. You can lower your blood pressure, you can lower your heart rate, you can lower your blood sugar levels, and you can change your biochemistry. You can even now we have proof that you can change your DNA and your genetic structure and the telomeres just by using mind, willpower, intention, strong focus, one-pointed laser-like mental focus, and of course the primary healing factor of all, and now we're getting to the big moment here, love and light. And this is to be, can be taken quite seriously. The universe is created uh, from the dark matter of love and brought forward in creation into the um, prominence of light, the creation of light. And all future medicine will be and must be, can only be used through the power of the love of the universe. It's an energetic vibration in the dark matter and through the creation of the stars and galaxies, which are, of course, all made of light, color, and sound. This is going back to the ancient Sanskrit texts we have in the Vedas, in the Upanishads, in India. So taking into account the four energy bodies of the etheric spiritual, the causal mental, superconscious, conscious, and unconscious, the emotional astral, the physical material body, which is genetic and biochemical and otherwise. All these in a general systems theory brought together through the cosmogenesis of how humans were created as a species and as individuals and how they can heal and evolve and transform and grow and become perfectly healthy when they use all of these factors, the love and light of the universe. And no, this is not age. This is actually spiritual science. And this is ancient, and it's actually beyond the earth plane, and it's interdimensional. And then, of course, mind, willpower, intention, emotion, emotional feeling and power of, of truth, of the hope and the freedom that knowing you can create this for yourself. And also then the taking the action and doing it through yoga, meditation, energy work, and moving the light inside and around you in a flow, which is why we call it I Am Kundalini Kriya Yoga, a combination of all the ancient yogas from um, the Vedas and from India, China, and Tibet. Well, we've said quite a lot. Um, I think it's time now to close for now. The, the way that people will heal themselves in the next little while will all be through reconnecting with their source, the source inside your magnetic heart, going into your super consciousness and into Christ consciousness, Buddha consciousness, and into the cosmic consciousness. And this is the endeavor, this is the task, and this is the method and the path to creating your own self-healing. And you can and will do this. As the decades move forward here in the 21st century, we will see that all the people eventually from around the globe, young and old, and all the cultures, will throw off the yoke of suffering and savagery in some case, and all the ways that we've been treated by the different professions that are just trying to take power for themselves and take power over us and use force and telling us that they only are the ones with the knowledge and the, the ability to heal. Well, the, the truth is that spirit is what heals us. It's not people. It's our reconnection with the source, with the spirit of love, the spirit of the Christ consciousness that can and will and does heal us. Many people have proved this, and Jesus being one in his resurrected body, which all people uh, were there to see 2,000 years ago. And so all we as well can do and will be doing the same thing. All love and blessings to you. I hope you find this at least invigorating and inspiring, give you lots to reflect on mentally and emotionally and spiritually, and we hope to be seeing you again soon with our next parts in this series, including the next one, to follow this, which is on the philosophy of medicine. All love and blessings, namaste. I see and recognize the God, Goddess within you.